can't do this anymore, man. This, this quarantine, this isolation, it's driving me crazy. It's killing me. Like, I'm a prisoner in my own home. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get some fresh air. I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a haircut. I gotta get out of here. Liberate! 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 Well, time to see what all the fuss is about and look at Fighting With My Family. My viewers have been asking me to talk about this movie ever since it came out last year and now it's finally happening. I should have known my tactic of putting it off for no reason would eventually come back to haunt me once I suddenly had more time to watch movies. Fighting is based off a documentary of a similar name that first aired on Channel 4 in the UK in 2012. Called The Wrestlers Fighting With My Family, the doc focused on the night wrestling family, the journey of youngest kids Zack and Brittany as they both tried to make it in WWE, and how the family dynamic shifted when only Brittany got signed. They say it's like TNA, tits and ours, we're, that's what we're there for. I want to change that. I want to be for wrestling as well. That's the whole point of me wanting to come here so I can at least change that, take it back to the attitude era. Ooh, clearly young Paige doesn't remember how ladies got airtime during the attitude era. Anyway, legend has it, Dwayne Johnson was in London filming one of the 18 Fast and Furious movies and stumbled upon the documentary while in his hotel room. Fascinated with the story, one that he could relate to as a member of a wrestling dynasty of his own, The Rock was convinced that it was perfect to adapt to Hollywood. Eventually, Stephen Merchant, who's best known for his work alongside Ricky Gervais and for co-starring with The Rock and Tooth Fairy, would sign on as writer and director of the film, throw in a strong cast and a sizable budget, and things looked promising. This movie had a lot of buzz surrounding it in the months leading up to the premiere, but not all for great reasons. Production was taking place during a very tumultuous time in Paige's life, where most of her goings-on resulted in embarrassing headlines and some colorful rebuttals from her family. With so much drama going on with the wrestler the entire movie was based around, some were convinced that Paige would have gotten the axe long ago if it weren't for how much money WWE was pouring into their film project. Those fears seemed to dissipate once Paige finally came back to entering action in November of 2017, only to be forced into retirement one month later after an errant kick to the back at a house show. Suddenly this heartwarming movie about a girl who fought the odds to make a name for herself in the sport felt a bit hollow when the current timeline provided us with a sad, definitive end date to the fairy tale story. That being said, if there's one thing we've learned in the last couple of years is that WWE will push through anything, anything, anything to accomplish their goals. Fighting With My Family was released in early 2019 to rave reviews. Though not entirely faithful to the documentary, or even to wrestling for that matter, the movie made its money back and then some, and as of right now, it has a 93% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It is far and away the most successful movie WWE Studios has ever produced, and to think it only took them 17 years to get there. So based on the numbers and all that, I guess it's the first time I've had to punch up at a wrestling movie. First time for everything, I guess. Let's begin with what the story is really all about. If you smell what the rock is cooking. Right away we begin with The Rock, the film hitting you in the face after spitting into its metaphorical hand. A young Zack Knight is watching King of the Ring 2000, which wouldn't be my first choice of footage to use. I mean, if Wikipedia is to be believed, the movie opens up in 2002. His match with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania just happened, so why not show that match? <laughs> Uh-uh, see that? The TV says Paige, and then we cut to see Paige? Good foreshadowing there. As Zack and Brittany wrestle over the remote, we meet Father Ricky, played by the hilarious Nick Frost, and Mother Julie, aka Sweet Soraya, played by Lena Headey, who played Cersei Lannister in the Game of Thrones series. Now that's range. Don't worry folks, this movie has a way better conclusion than season 8. Now that we've all met the family, time for a big exposition dump. But she's not just pretty on the outside, is she? In there is a heart of gold. Mm. Do anything for anyone. Quick, we gotta let people know that Paige is the hero of this movie right now! Ricky Knight runs the World Association of Wrestling in Norwich, England, and has long been grooming his children for wrestling stardom in America. According to him, his children's success in WWE would lead to even bigger success for his own company. Look at that. Look at that. That's all you. Now imagine you get on the main roster, huh? We'll make millions. I mean, if you can make millions in merchandise off someone whose appearance and trademarks you technically don't own the rights to anymore, then go for it, man. 
In this scene, Ricky is worried as his upcoming show is short one talent for their 18 and under match. If I have to give refunds, I am buggered six ways to Sunday. You'd have to give out refunds if you had to change up your children's matchup? Boy, they take it seriously there in the UK. Brittany's reluctant to help out because she doesn't care about wrestling, but she's talked into it to help out the family. To get around the whole intergender thing, Zach employs a clever disguise. Hmm, with all this trademark infringement, I wonder if Ricky Knight was part of those shows with the fake WWF guys too. Anyway, Zach's there to help walk Brittany through it, and wouldn't you know, she takes to it immediately. <laughs> I'm not surprised The Rock took such a liking to this story. It really does mirror his own experience. If you ever read The Rock's autobiography from 2000, it's littered with similar stories of a young Johnson doing things in wrestling for the first time and absolutely acing them with no problems. It's almost too perfect. Seeing Paige just instantly being good at wrestling in this movie gave me some very similar vibes, but as we later discover, it's not all sunshine and roses for our heroine. And before I go any further, I have to address the timeline in this movie, because right away, my brain is hurting. I've already talked about how weird it was to see Zack watching such old footage for the time, but what's really interesting is the year this opening scene takes place in. If we really are in 2002, that means Brittany is roughly 10 in this flashback, a whole three years before she has her first match in real life. Then again, we do see Zack playing with a cardboard spinner belt, which would exist in 2005, when this is all actually supposed to take place, and the ages would line up better. Well, that is the last time I used Wikipedia as a source. That's a lie. So here we are now in 2011. Brittany is the shining star of WAW, wrestling alongside the rest of her family. Zach's the head trainer at the wrestling school, teaching all sorts of small children. I guess it's not worth getting into the minutia of why kids are allowed to train that young in the UK, but oh well. Zach even tries to train a blind kid. Oh, no thanks. I'll just come here for the smells. Good enough place for that, at least. We also get a funny scene in the office between Ricky and Big Daddy if he were in the DC multiverse. Glenn wants to know if you will take one of these in the face. <laughs> yeah? Zach's gotten his girlfriend pregnant, so the two families are gonna get together for a meal. Ooh, we're gonna get some good classism here. What sort of people do enjoy wrestling? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it's all fake anyway, isn't it? So it's yeah. Come again? This awkward dinner gets even more so when the phone rings, Brittany answers, and without even figuring out who it is, puts it on speaker and plops it on the middle of the table. Boy, it's a good thing the guy on the other end was important to the plot. Hello, you are under investigation from the FBI and the IRS. The police are right outside your door. Please call back and give us your credit card information and social security number. It is the only way for us to take your money. I mean for us to protect you from the police. Goodbye. In actuality, it's a call from WWE saying that Zach and Brittany have been chosen to take part in a tryout in London. And we already have a Brittany, so just think of an alternative name. They already had a Brittany? In 2011? Who the fuck are they talking about? As the Knights celebrate the good news, the old fuddy-duddies rear their overly posh heads once again. What is the WWE? Trailer shot. The girlfriend's parents are then sat down to watch a whole ass WWE highlight reel they just happened to have queued up and ready to go. Naturally, it's all clips of the golden era and the attitude era. They hardly use anything after 2004. Not too proud of the modern product much, are we? It's tryout day. At the O2 Arena in London, Zach and Brittany have stars in their eyes and don't question what this newfangled logo and SmackDown Live imagery are doing here in 2011. The siblings then completely mark out when they meet everyone's favorite, The Rock, fresh out of Hollywood to do business with John Cena in a scene that absolutely did not happen in real life. What's up, Zach? What an honor to meet you, mate. Oh, thanks, Zach. Yeah, yeah Zach, Zach, yeah. We've been fans since you had hair. Oh, thank you. Hey, it's a choice. The damn good one, too. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it, yeah, it looks yeah. good. It's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, you should come to one of our shows. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. can get you tickets. Look, I don't blame you for going all fanboy on The Rock. If it were me, I'd probably act like a twit in front of him as well. But, I mean, you guys were raised up in the wrestling business. Show some poise. Even if you've never seen the movie, you've probably seen this clip in the commercials about a hundred times, and the two ask The Rock how they can be popular and successful like him, only for him to respond by cutting a standard Rock promo. So that's how you went over the crowd. Anyway, on to the tryout. Hi, Dave Mastiff. Hi, Big Joe. Hi, not Pete Dunne. Oh, probably shouldn't swear. Not when there's ladies present. Sorry, miss. Sorry about that. 
Ha <laughs> ha, get it? He has long hair, so he's mistaken for a girl. Hey, considering how tight-knit some wrestling territories can be, don't you think it's possible the Knights would know who some of these wrestlers are? Vince Vaughn plays Hutch Morgan, a fictional trainer for WWE. According to interviews, Morgan's character is supposed to be an amalgamation of Paige's biggest trainers in developmental, including Bill DeMott, Sarah Amato, and Dusty Rhodes. Well, until Vince Vaughn makes someone do a naked donut stink face to another trainee or his forehead looks like a tapestry of scar tissue, I'm not buying it. Morgan's a no-nonsense trainer who has a clever takedown for everyone. Paige feels a little more like she might work at the perfume counter at the mall. Like a, that's called a great attitude. That is one of the biggest requirements that you have to have to be a WWE superstar. You, know, you don't have any of the other things. She showed us her heart. And I want to vomit. Yeah. That's what you mixed up in a bowl? Yeah, I like it. Okay. Do you know what a push-up is? Oh, settle down, R. Lee Ermey. After what I think are supposed to be completely improvised scraps, Hutch offers Paige a developmental deal on the spot and nobody else. Awkward. Paige pleads with Hutch to bring Zack along as well and even threatens not to sign, but ultimately does so on behalf of her family. In one of the last moments before she leaves for America, we get a touching scene of Paige in her childhood bedroom. Hold on, stop, stop for a second. Why is Paige holding a cardboard Divas Championship? Like, okay, little kids make cardboard belts, tail as old as time, but the Divas Championship only debuted in 2008 when Paige was roughly 15 or 16 years old. That means this picture of 13-year-old Britney holding the Divas title is an impossibility. And furthermore, what 15 or 16-year-old kid makes cardboard belts at that age, especially when they've been wrestling since 13 and have already won actual championships? Does this shit not bother anyone else? In a tearful scene, Brittany says farewell to her family at the airport. Man, Cersei just can't keep a hold of her kids. I will give the movie credit here as they do a really good job showing the impact that Paige's signing has on the rest of her family. Especially Zack, who has conflicting feelings about his sister going to WWE before he does, though it was his dream before it was hers. But enough about that as Paige begins her new life in... Orlando! Orlando! I love you! At her new place, Paige meets some of the other ladies at Developmental. I'm Kirsten. Hi, Hi I'm Jerry Lynn. Oh. Jerry Lynn? I give a whole new meaning to the words, Judgment Day! Paige checks into her first day at Florida Championship. Uh, okay, looks like NXT and the Performance Center are things back then. And so is the Modern Championship with the current logo, which exists the same time as the Divas title, which only happened between 2014 and 2016. And holy crap, this is driving me bonkers. Look, I know trying to explain the transition from FCW to NXT is a level of detail that doesn't really need to be in this movie. And we all know that WWE is all about their revisionist history where they can iron out all those awkward growing phases of their developmental program. But you know who does remember those awkward phases? The wrestling fans you're banking on to watch this movie. And believe me, they remember everything. We get our first real montage of the movie, juxtaposing Paige's training with Zack's struggles on the British scene as he becomes a new dad. <laughs> okay, okay, look, I know that, you know, wrestling for WWE was your big dream and all, but you have a kid now. You have a kid! You're allowed to be happy about it for more than like 10 seconds! After a hard night falling on thumbtacks just to pay the bills, Zack rings up Morgan in an effort to get another tryout, but it goes nowhere. Just what time is it they're both up and working in different parts of the world and it's dark in both places? Meanwhile, at Not FCW, Paige is having a hard time ingratiating herself with others, big timing her fellow trainees, and even flopping in promo class. My name is Paige. And I am all the rage. I want Brody and I want him in a cage! After being called out for her unoriginality, Paige is immediately followed by someone who's even less original. My name is Nick Barnes. Now for those of you who don't know me, let me fill you in. Where I come from, you have to work hard to get what you want. We jump forward to our first NXT live show and woof this ring announcer. We are NXT and the future is now! The only NXT women in this movie with dialogue take part in a four-way, some kind of promo-off, basically. The other three ladies aren't supposed to be anyone we know, but it's worth pointing out that their outfits do resemble those of some that we do. Paige gets into the ring and is immediately heckled by fans. For a minute, I swore Jerry Lawler was the first voice. Yeah, this is what I paid for, three hot chicks and my dead grandmother. <laughs> Look on the bright side, at least he's not in a bikini. Man, there is nothing more unnerving as a wrestler than fans having full conversations about you that are totally audible to everyone in the arena. Reminds me of one of the first times I got in the ring. 
Man, this guy looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> yeah, but I've never seen the Doughboy with so much hair. <laughs> he's so pale that he's blinding me. <laughs> and I'll bet he cries himself to sleep every night on an anime body pillow. <laughs> Hey man, you're all right. I gotta take a piss. Wanna keep this convo going in the restroom? Sure, let's go. Wow, this is a spacious restroom. Look at all the soap. Holy crap, is that your real penis? I'm gonna stick your broomstick up your butt and fly you home to Hogwarts. Ah, see, these are the kind of unique promos that Hutch Morgan wants out of his workers. Paige gets the mic and is frozen in fear, which compels our rowdy fans to keep piling on. Speed! The power of Christ compels you! Seriously, do these fans also have microphones? Back in England, Zach's a bad dad and lets all the trainee kids down. While in Florida, Paige decides the best way to succeed is to look like everyone else. Damn, she did that in the night? I'd hate to see her bathroom right about now. The developmental class goes on a beach trip to do some training. Watching this scene gave me some serious tough enough vibes. Seems kind of weird they would leave their multi-million dollar training facility to go flip tires on the beach. Hey, Caljack. Yeah? You were in developmental for a while, right? Oh yeah. Yep. I was there. Did you ever go on one of these beach training field trips? Me? No. No. Not when I was there. Really? Yeah, Brian. We never trained at the beach. That's all that Hollywood magic going on right there. That's what that is. Hollywood magic. Okay, well, good to know. Thanks for answering. Hey, Brian, happy to help, but uh, I noticed you have that beautiful YouTube title in the background right there. <laughs> and we're done here. Paige continues her quick descent, failing at the beach and getting confrontational with the former models she holds in contempt. You don't know anything about me, or them, or about our lives, or why we're here. Well, you never told me. You never asked. Man, she really stepped in it again with Jerry Lynn and Madison and, um... Trixie? Janet? At a truck stop, Hutch has a brutally honest conversation with Paige about her conduct. When she brings up Zach, Hutch says he'd have a low ceiling if he were signed. He's chasing fame that's never gonna come to him. Probably let a real star throw him off a 30-foot cage onto a concrete floor. Why quit then? He wouldn't stop. So then the wife would leave him and take the kid. And he'd be all by himself and just wishing to God he could get his kid to return his phone call. And then you'll start crashing weddings to get that adrenaline rush, save a local gym by playing dodgeball, then you gotta move in with your younger brother who just happens to be Santa Claus. Yes, the whole warning about Zach was actually a cautionary tale about himself. But that's okay, because after all that miserable stuff happens, he gets a job as a scout and a trainer with WWE. Land of sunshine and happiness. Right? Paige's developmental runs on serious thin ice right before she heads home for Christmas break, working a show for her family. Just before going out to wrestle her brother, Paige tells Zach she decided not to go back to America. Now mad at her sister for throwing away the dream he never got to chase, he used this chance to go against the script. <laughs> well, of course Zach's not coming out of the corner. You didn't call a spot. In fact, Zach's so mad about all this, he decides to hit Paige with a shoot pile driver to win the match. Oh, she's fine then. Zach spills the beans about Paige quitting WWE to her family before he leaves and goes missing. The family find him at a pub. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. A bar for my American viewers. And gets himself into a fight. The visual of the brawl set the cheery Christmas music is one of the true highlights of the movie. <laughs> After the fight, we get an emotional confrontation between Paige and Zack. Zack tells his sister not to throw away her dream, while Paige tells Zack that he has so much to live for as a dad, husband, and a wrestling trainer. Plus, he's not in a weird relationship with his mother, so that's a plus? Back at the house, Ricky tells Paige that she's the spark, the lifeblood of the family, and finally takes the pressure off by saying she can do what she wants with her life. That's nice. With everything settled with her family, Paige returns to the PC, once again with the black hair and pale skin. I swear you spent a couple weeks in England and poof, all that melanin, just gone. Now dedicated to proving herself to Morgan, we see a getting better montage where she kills her workouts and supports her fellow lady wrestlers. Can I join? 
Well, normally they hate matches with an even number of people, but just this once. It all crescendos with their showcase match, and after much practice, they finally nail their double suicide dive. Then they all look at each other with satisfaction in front of everyone while the match is still going. Kayfabe is shattered, the business is dead, roll the credits. Just kidding. After impressing Morgan with her training, Paige is one of the chosen few to attend WrestleMania 30. Oh, and Paige and Zack's half-brother Roy, who they dedicated maybe three lines of dialogue about up to this point, is finally out of prison. Good for him. But that's really not important to the story. Back in New Orleans, dig those wrestler cameos. The Miz, Sheamus, and The Big Show. You know I'm an emotional eater. You're enabling me now. This is gonna make me gain weight. You burn it off in the ring, it's great. Look at this. I song. can't burn it off. As much as you want. Man, where was this kind of energy on The Big Show show? Hutch beckons Paige to follow him to a suite at the Silver Dome. I mean, the Superdome. Why'd they hang random pay-per-view posters in the hallway? There she meets The Rock once again. They call the rest of Paige's family in Norwich, and what happens next will change Paige's life forever. Tomorrow night, she'll make her debut live on Raw, and she will be fighting AJ Lee for the Divas title. Oh. Oh, that is just, oh, that's just bullshit right there. We have seen some serious manipulation of the timeline up to this point, but that has got to be the worst example of it. First of all, we have completely bypassed Paige's run as the first NXT Women's Champion. Second of all, what in the blue hell is The Rock doing telling Paige and her family all this? It's just some Hollywood magic here, some flimsy excuse to get The Rock more involved in the story because, oh, he's the executive producer and he has the star power. There's no way he has the authority to actually tell Paige that, huh. Really? He really told her she was getting called the next night? Seems like an absolutely, completely made up way to move the story along, but apparently that encounter actually happened. Truth is stranger than fiction, I guess. And not only that, in real life, it was this conversation where The Rock told Paige the movie about her life was going to be made. Meaning we are witnessing the genesis of this movie in the movie itself. <laughs> Back in England, Zack's got the spirit again and returns to training the youngsters. He gets them all back in the van, including this one who hangs out with a drug dealer, played by Zack Bevis, and a group of kids who are just trying to do some vandalism in broad daylight. Even the blind kid gets to work in the ring. All is right in the world again. The next day, Paige is backstage at Future Raw. She's getting ready in a locker room that's labeled for female talent and Paige. Not a good way to make friends, is it? In a full circle moment, Paige begins to doubt herself when Zack calls to calm her down. They're video chatting while Zack's just sitting in the middle of a darkened ring. Totally natural. It's finally time for the match, and look, it's Zelina Vega playing AJ Lee, apparently. Hmm. Now, I will admit, I haven't seen too much of AJ's work. I didn't really watch a lot during this time period, but even I know, that is not AJ Lee. What about this look screams AJ Lee to you? It's just Zelina wearing her own gear to the ring. They made no effort for her to look or sound anything likely in this movie. It's not as if AJ had a look that was hard to replicate. The set and logo discrepancy is one thing, but I'm just taken aback at how lazy this choice was. You might as well have said that she was playing Stephanie McMahon or China, it would have been as effective. But it's okay, because the outfit Paige wears in her debut doesn't resemble reality in any way either. Yes, Paige comes out in the middle of AJ Lena Vega's promo. Hey, by the way, no respect for Tamina. But once she gets in the ring, she just sits there, frozen up yet again. And now the match is being presented as a shoot for some reason, even though they have established on many occasions just how worked everything is, I don't know anymore. Finally, Paige fires back and does her trademark yell in a shot that definitely looks like it was done in front of a green screen. Paige gets out of the Black Widow and hits the Paige Turner, at least that was done better in the movie than in real life, and wins the championship. And unlike in real life, we get the big Hollywood speech about being true to yourself. It belongs to anyone who ever felt like they are the freak from Norwich, the oddballs, the outsiders. The ones that don't belong. Come on now, Paige, if you're gonna do a big emotional speech about inclusivity, you have to remember the branding. You be who you are. Be a star. The film ends with some lovely little blurbs about the main characters. For example, this one about Paige. It's nice they acknowledged her early impact since it has been kind of glossed over in the years that followed her initial run on the main roster. And despite it being an elephant in the room, they didn't end the film on a downer by adding that Paige wasn't even wrestling anymore by the time this film was released. They also say that Zack and Roy continue to wrestle together as a team. What they don't mention is they'd probably get more looks if it weren't for the elder Roy putting his foot in his mouth online. And of course, The Rock went on to a successful career outside wrestling, no kidding. Side note, before they filmed that wrestling scene after Raw in LA back in 2017, The Rock came out to hype up the crowd, even called CM Punk on his cell phone in front of everybody. It would only take another two years for him to finally answer. And that was Fighting With My Family. What do you want me to say? 
It was a good movie. Yes, there are a ton of issues with the timeline and the sequence of events and the iconography that some wrestling purists and fans of the documentary will take umbrage with. Not to mention the amount of WWE propaganda can be really jarring at times. But it doesn't matter if I pick apart that stuff all day, because in the broader sense, wrestling serves as the primary vehicle for some great storytelling. Themes of chasing dreams, the importance of family, the scourge of jealousy, it's all done in an almost too light-hearted but still entertaining package with some terrific acting to boot. Florence Pugh, Vince Vaughn, and Nick Frost are some of my favorites of the bunch. Things aren't 100% true to life, but that's Hollywood for you, I guess. If you want authenticity, you can always watch the documentary on YouTube. Hey, by the way, how'd the family get FCW footage in England? When it comes to films that portray wrestling in a somewhat positive, somewhat realistic way, you could do a lot worse than this. Come for the wrestling, want to leave because of the wrestling at first, then end up staying for the heartwarming tale. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.